How are you all doing, ladies and gentlemen? So we can do it with World War One, oversimplified part one. Now, I was actually told in the comment section to do World War Two oversimplified, but I thought to myself, you know what? If we're going to do World War Two, we might as well do start with World War One first. Now, World War One, um, I know how it happened. I think most people do. Um, I'm definitely less familiar with World War One than I am with World War Two, but World War Two I'm not that familiar with either. Like when you're asking about history, I'm much more of like a like a I almost want to say like a Renaissance period kind of history buff um, on anything like around that area. But uh, Renaissance, I mean, that's more music area. But I guess um, more so from like the 1300 to like the honestly like 1700. Um, World War One. Um, Franz Ferdinand Arch um, Bishop. Um, no, yeah, uh, shot dead. Hungary World War started between Austria, I believe, and on Hungary, um, and then obviously with the alliances. You know, alliances nowadays they are quite massive. Um, it all just kind of escalated. Now that's what I think it was. Um, again, it, it's been a while since, and I'm not that all that familiar with World War One in the first place, but. It was like a super coincidence, like like you got like like the the uh, I think, no, it's not Archbishop, it's Duke, Duke Franz Ferdinand, I believe. Um, yeah, you know, like a super coincidence where like you know oh the shooter would have missed him, but like this happened and that happened and this happened and that happened. It's like ah, uh, so many coincidences. It seemed like fate, but I always said like all I read was like it always was like inevitable. Like everyone knew the war was coming, and it was only like a the trigger. Yeah, the, the, just something to like set it off, and that's basically where we ended off with here. So this could be World War One oversimplified part one. If you've not um, seen the original video by oversimplified, please go ahead and check them out. I will have the link in the description for them in uh, in the comment section down below. In the description down below, so you can see their video. Um, I you know they put all the time and effort, and I'm just here watching it, giving my own intake. And again, it's World War One, so I'm not all familiar with. I can't really give much of an intake and much of uh, much of my knowledge here. But hey. I always enjoy acquiring new knowledge. So let us hop right in with World War One Oversimplified Part 1. The world of 1914, a time of modern technology, culture, and fashion. Truly the height of civilization. Let's have a war. Pretty much. Everyone knew a big war was coming. France wanted some stuff back that Germany had taken from it. Germany wanted to take more of everyone's stuff. And they yep. were building a big sexy navy that was making the British uncomfortable. So, um, yeah, <laughs> literally the one thing that I didn't know, which was like war, everyone, like war is essentially inevitable, like it just needed a spark right away confirmed, um, which means that from now on, from this point on, I'm prob I probably don't know anything really. Um, let me just move the microphone a little bit so I can actually see the screen properly. There we go. Obviously Germany had like, from what I remember, Germany had like the strongest, um, for the strongest army when it came to like foot soldiers, ground soldiers, whereas England, you know, they've always had the um the navy um supremacy. Um so you know well I, I can't say for certain that Germany had the strongest force because obviously then you think about Russia. But I from what I remember Germany had like the most soldiers, um foot soldiers. But Britain had um the strongest navy. I think that's what it is. I'm like ninety nine percent sure, but like I can't say you know a hundred percent sure because I don't want to give like false facts, facts quote unquote false facts, um, false statements that I'm saying definitiv definitively when they're not. The Eastern Empire thought they were really cool, but lots of different people who lived there didn't think it was so cool, and some of them had even been declaring independence with help from Russia. Everyone was talking about each other behind each other's backs. Yep. Throwing the fact that military okay. technology had come a long way since the last major war, and suddenly everyone was pretty eager to beat each other up. In this area of Austria-Hungary lived some Serbs and Bosnians who hated living in Austria-Hungary. So the Austro-Hungarian Archduke Franz Ferdinand Duke. Got there for a I was right. In an open-top car with his car's route published in advance, and that went just about as well as you'd expect. <laughs> some assassins were waiting for him along the way and threw bombs at his car, but they missed and blew up some officers behind him instead. So the Archduke goes into hiding, leaves Sarajevo, and the whole war never happens. Except no, the Archduke doesn't leave, but instead goes back out in the open top car Stupid. to visit the injured officers in Stupid. Hospital. The driver takes a wrong turn, and by sheer coincidence gets stuck beside one of the failed assassins. Who shoots him. You see how stupid this is? 
it, it, it's like it was destined to happen. That's basically what it is. I didn't, I didn't know all that. I just knew that like it was like a bunch of coincidences that ultimately led to it. But it's like that just doesn't seem like a coincidence, right? That seems like a plot, like a driver was in on it or something. I don't know, but you know, why would the driver be in on it? Do 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 do. Austria Hungary is understandably pissed about all this, and they think the Serbian government had something to do with it, which they might have. So they go to their ally Germany and say, hey Germany, we're going to declare war in Serbia, and Germany is all for that. So Austria Hungary sends a big list of impossible demands to Serbia, and when Serbia refuses, they declare war. I didn't war. even know that about the list of demands, I thought it just straight Austria up declared war. Germany are friends, and Serbia is protected by Russia, who's friends with France, so they all declare war on each other. Yep. Montenegro joins in too. France and Britain also have a kind of alliance. Yeah. When France says, hey Britain, you got my back? Yeah. Britain is like, maybe. And then they decide to stay out of it. It's <laughs> great for Germany, because Germany has a plan. They know that Russia is so big and clumsy that it will take them a while to get ready for war. So with this guy in charge, Germany will send Malka. all its troops into France at lightning speed while Russia's getting ready. Defeat France, then move all the troops to Russia and defeat Russia. That sounds like World War II, eh? German and eat Tatra Potast every day. Just one problem. France has loads of forts and defenses along its German border. Yeah. And Germany can't waste any time fighting them. So Germany decides to go around them. Through Belgium. Belgium is neutral, but Germany wants to march 750,000 troops through it. That's to not going to fly. Defenses. They're hoping Belgium will just kind of sit down and shut up. But they don't. They fight back. Yeah. And they're pretty good too, so they slow the Germans. That's down. not going to work. The is that Britain shows up. And they're pretty pissed that Germany is invading neutral countries. So now Britain declares war in Germany. So Germany push on through Belgium. That's how it all falls. Atrocities along the way. They also wear spikes and sometimes skulls on the uniform. So if you're trying to not look like the bad guys, <laughs> good job. The Allies have a propaganda extravaganza, and this starts having an influence around the world, notably in America. The U.S. President Woodrow Wilson sees himself as a bit of a Jesus figure and spends most of the war trying to get everyone to just hug it out. Nope. There's also a large population of ethnic Germans living in the United States, and yep. when the war first broke out, they were like, yay, Germans. Yeah. But now that they're committing atrocities in Belgium, they're less enthusiastic. Let's play Spot the French Soldier. Uh, Easy, yeah. right? He's wearing a bright blue uniform with red trousers. And do you know who else spotted him easily, too? Sure. The Germans. Good camouflage. Slowly marching in columns through the countryside, the Germans easily tore them to shreds with their Good camouflage. All the nations involved in this war went in with an old school war mentality. Tanks. And all of them had to update their uniforms and tactics a lot during the Great War. Because this war was going to be like nothing anyone had ever seen before. Yeah. Russia is ready for war, and way earlier than expected. Hey, Austria Hungary, can you get on top of that? Nope. Oh, yeah, sure, we've got this. Destroyed. Job. So Germany has to send some troops back to the east to defend against the Russians. The chief of staff of the Austro-Hungarian army is this guy, and although he is handsome, he turns out not to be the best military strategist. Austria-Hungary constantly ignores Germany's advice, and then comes running back to Germany whenever they get in trouble. Austria See, that's why... Granted, Austria was massive back then, and they're still relatively huge, but not nearly as big as they were. Germany, obviously, um, if you look at their topography right now, I think that's the right word, topography. They're, you know, Germany basically ends, like, here. Like, uh, I'm sure you can see the mouse. Like, like roughly, like, here. It's like a ding, ding, ding. It's like, like, like almost like a circle, but it's not really. And, like, a bit of land is, like, gone here. That's how it looks like right now, I believe. Um, obviously, you know, back then, they were massive. You know, it looks like a thumb, like a hat. But back then, they were massive. You know, massive two massive superpowers back then but you need to have the tactical um capabilities to fend off france belgium the uk and russia and obviously world war Two, and obviously so and world war Two, you know it's a little, it goes a little bit different because of different alliances but pick your allies well <laughs> pick your allies well like and repels all their invasion attempts at the start of the war. That's what I mean. For Germany in the north, though, they almost completely wipe out the Russian second army. Back on the western front, the Germans continue advancing and are in sight of Paris. At this point, anyone would be forgiven for thinking the Germans were going to get that quick victory after all. But, but then things start to go wrong. The French commander-in-chief knew something had to be done, and he ordered his armies to stop retreating. 
In the resulting battle, a gap opened up in the German line. If I can use that. Up, the enemy can use the flanking from the side and behind. Yeah. So the German armies have to retreat. The Allies launch a counterattack, and the Germans dig into defensive positions. The Allies do the same. Is that the Christmas? Both sides move north, trying to outflank each other along the way. When they reach the sea, they're in stalemate. That's. Uh, Dunkirk, right? Uh, from there and then going, yeah, I think that's what it is. Like, like right here on the border, I, I just I think that's what it is. No, obviously, this more so World War Two, obviously Dunkirk. Um, but like, 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 it's funny how it's like the same area. I think like either Dunkirk is like down here. No, it has to be here, because like the, the the road was like, and that's like the most narrow area. Or, or like you know. I've only seen the movie Don't Go Granted but that, you know, that's where I get all my information from but it wasn't that far like like where even like normal fisher boats could like go and pick their men up and go back so I'm assuming it was right around here and in the movie Don't Cook again I'm basing it off the movie alright so I'm not that familiar but it has to be this one it has to be like right here on the edge because it wasn't that far um, unless it's like this tiny little place here Still seems rather far, honestly, for like a tiny ship, uh, a, a tiny boat to like, travel all the way. But yeah, it, it's funny how like it's always um, from, from like this angle. I mean, obviously, where else is Germany gonna attack from? But like you'd figure that they could maybe go south and then try and strike France, you know, from down here. But no, it's always just directly. Like let's just let's just. I mean, granted, the border is here, but it's always just like let's head directly in there. And it's almost worked. I think in World War Two, yeah, in World War Two, it did work. So, who am I to say anything? The beginning of trench warfare on the Western Front. Here's how trench warfare works. Two opposing lines of trenches with no man's land in between. One side would pummel the other with hundreds of thousands of artillery shells, sometimes for days at a time. This had a huge psychological effect on the soldiers, leaving many shell shocked. Then, the attacking troops would leave their trenches and rush across no man's land. A muddy wet mass of shell craters and barbed wire. The defending trench would unleash machine gun fire on the attackers, inflicting thousands of casualties. The attackers would send wave after wave until either they gave up or the opposing trench was finally overrun. Yep. There would be months of fighting and the deaths of thousands in order to gain a few meters or kilometers of land. Living in the trenches was hard work. This seems insane. Boxes, mud that could swallow you whole, pools of poisonous water, rats, disease, the smell. It's insane that millions of soldiers put up with these conditions. Actually, the video's almost over. Alright, well, I was just about to say, um, that's where, like, all, I think, it wasn't penicillin, because penicillin was the one that was created in a lab, um, where, uh, the scientist forgot his, for, for, forgot, um, his experiment, I think, not experiment, what, what's the right, what's the phrase, if it, for, anyway, the scientist forgot, I think it's a test tube, um, no, it was like a, what, what do you call this, the round pots, with, like, bacteria and um, viruses and so on and so forth but like all I remember is like penicillin was made that way where like he, the, the guy that was doing it forgot it and ultimately came back he's like wait what's going on here and then realized what was happening and that's how he got penicillin but I think it was was it painkillers uh, like in, in the current form that we have him um, that was like found out in World War One um, and then used to the extreme because of all the trenches, the all, all the wars in a trench. I might be getting my things mis mixed up here, but uh, I think that's what it was. Like, just the regular old painkillers that we have, you know, in, in the form that we have them today were used um, as a uh, medication for all the soldiers that were, you know, enduring all of these hardships in the trenches. You know, if you think of war back then, and it just sounds such, so much more mentally taxing, whereas war right now, which is a lot more destructive, but perhaps a lot less mentally taxing, um, again, that's debatable, but I would probably say yes, because you know it's, it's much easier to head into a battle and then leave a battle, you know, in a week or, or or maybe like three weeks or so, instead of like being in a battle where every day for like months you're just one inch further, one inch backwards, and you're just like constantly defending for like a month or so. So I could be wrong here again. I, you know, I, I'm I'm not a soldier, so I don't know what. You know, granted, I don't think there's any soldier alive that would know what is more mentally taxing because you know nobody's lived through both but nowadays war is or oh, weapons are a lot more destructive and ultimately 
ultimately, I feel like it's a lot quicker because they're so destructive. Um, granted, we haven't had a World War Three, so we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Hopefully, there won't be one. Um, but hopefully, if if there is one, hopefully it won't be in my lifetime. But hey, ladies and gentlemen, world, that was World War One Oversimplified Part 1. We're going to be watching Part 2 in a separate video. And that will probably come out tomorrow. That way there we'll have like a nice little Part 1 today, Part 2 tomorrow. Maybe World War 2 Part 1 in 3 days and World War 2 Part 2 in 4 days. Haha. <laughs> so we have content every single day. Haha. <laughs> Regardless, ladies and gentlemen, I will be seeing you all in the next one, everyone. Until then, have a nice day. Peace out and bye.